Hello, everyone, and welcome to the GUI and Automation Workshop. Just a few housekeeping items before we start. This session is being recorded, and we'll send it out shortly after its conclusion. If you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section, and we'll get to as many as we can. And now, let me introduce our speakers. Celso was not able to join us today due to an unforeseen conflict, but we do have a couple of very good speakers for you. That includes Dr. Arindam Shekaborty, who is a Managing Partner and Director of Advanced Engineering here at BIAS. He is a mechanical engineer with more than 10 years of strong academic and consulting experience in solid mechanics and design, nonlinear FEA, fatigue and fracture mechanics, reliability and optimization analysis, composite structures in oil and gas, nuclear and structural design. We also have Georgie McDonough, who is a mechanical engineer and whose experience involves teaching and consulting and FEA analysis using Simulia Abacus. He holds a master's degree in mechanical and subsea engineering. We also have Chris Hebura, who is a mechanical engineer with more than 15 years of experience using Python programming language for creating pre and post processing scripts and customize GUI applications to interface with Abacus CAE, as well as a standalone Python scripts and GUI applications to automate workflow outside of Abacus. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Georgie. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for the kind of introduction about all of us. Um, can you guys uh, hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so uh, today uh, we're going to do a webinar on the very interesting topic, uh, which is the automation of analysis in uh, Abacus using the uh, Python scripting and the uh, GUI uh, toolkit. So let's get started. Uh, so uh, this is the agenda for today. Uh, first, we would like to introduce the vice the company, who we are and what we do. Uh, next, we're going to jump uh, straight to the main topic of the webinar, which is the purpose of the analysis automations, and uh, we're going to cover some of the examples of it. Uh, then we're going to look at the automation and the uh, customization of Abacus CE, and we're going to wrap up our webinar with, uh, with a li uh, live demos. And at the end of the webinar, uh, we're going to take some of your questions, uh, if you have any. And also, uh, if you'd like to discuss uh, your workflow with us and how it can help, uh, please drop a message uh, during the webinar and for a free consulting call. So we can we can help you with that also. Uh, so uh, so who we are? Uh, we are a multidisciplinary company, and uh, we perform our simulations using the uh, finite element analysis uh, and uh, other tools, uh, finite analysis, and uh, using tools uh, such as uh, uh, Abacus. Uh, and also the CFD tools uh, in the kind of construction regions. Um, we're working in the areas, uh, multiple areas, uh, such as oil and gas, uh, machinery, equipment, uh, petrochemicals and process, uh, airspace, life science, and uh, uh, manufacturing automotives. Uh, we have a presence in the multiple countries. Um, so countries are listed here, uh, US, uh, uh, Canada, Mexico, and uh, we're also opening up a new office in, in Turkey. And uh, we have clients all over the world. Um, we also have a very strong uh, technical team, uh, which uh, consists of uh, 70 plus employees with a, um, with, uh, they have a, a lot of uh, good experience and technical experience and a good background. Uh, we also keep expanding and uh, our team, our team is growing constantly. Um, as a part of a technical service uh, and uh, software solutions, we also have uh, resources, not only in like, you know, product knowledge, but uh, uh, our team also have experience uh, in areas like uh, design, um, solid mechanics, uh, manufacturing, materials and corrosion, uh, numerical analysis, and uh, system and hardware architecture. Uh, so in addition uh, to our software, we uh, also provide trainings uh, to our customers and uh, uh, if they require any customization or automation, uh, or let's say work development, uh, we can also provide that for them uh, if needed. Um, uh, Tobias is the platinum pl partner of the cell system. So uh, uh, we have, uh, we are providing the uh, solutions, uh, software solution with a similar portfolio like Abacus, uh, iSight, Fisafe, and Tosca, and also in uh, Katia, uh, Delmi, and Enovia. Um, this is a slide about the technical capabilities. 
uh, of, of what type of engineering service uh, that we offer. Uh, from the structural side, we offer the component design and the validation using simulation techniques, uh, which can include uh, structural and vibrations, um, design optimization, reliability. Uh, we also perform the fitness uh, for service assessment. We can look uh, why the product, why your product is failed, and uh, perform the uh, fracture, anal fracture mechanics analysis and uh, uh, damage assessment. Um, we also can perform the fatigue assessment uh, of the structure. In addition to that, we provide the electromagnetic and the multifix, uh, multifix simulations. We also have a strong uh, composite um, simulation capabilities, which can uh, enable the design activities. Um, we also have our CFD capabilities, uh, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, so most of the problems are now moving to the multi uh, multi-physics uh, applications. So um, we can uh, couple either with this, we can couple the structure uh, with a uh, heat transfer and uh, uh, look uh, look into more like a multi-physics problem. Uh, we can also try to optimize um, your fluid behavior um, and your system design. Uh, we can uh, also perform like a combustion analysis, heat transfer, erosion and corrosion studies, um, chemical reactions, and uh, thermal fluid structure interactions. Um, the list is um, very extensive. Um, it's just some of the examples that are listed here. Um, from the electromagnetic uh, capabilities, um, we have several tools to perform electromagnetic analysis. Um, we had uh, multiple projects in the uh, um, design of antennas. We have a, we provide a bi biomedical uh, um, and uh, electromechanical service, um, optical and uh, accelerated components, sensors, and the filter design. So if you're interested in any of the services, you can uh, contact us directly, and uh, we'll be happy to help you guys. And uh, regarding the design side, um, in, uh, in addition to like uh, uh, like a tea service that we offer. Uh, we also have uh, specialized capabilities uh, where um, our resources have a uh, significant uh, industry experience in the uh, in the, in the areas of composites, uh, machining, electrical and fluid systems, uh, uh, function driven generative designs. In addition to that, we can also help you to automate your existing solution. And uh, we can also look into the system level applications where we can actually um, uh, bring your product uh, within the system and uh, look at the performance of your product. Um, as I mentioned before, we also offer the training courses um, either in-house or in client facility. Um, right now, like most of our training uh, courses went online um, due to pandemic, but uh, uh, in the future we'll be offering them. Uh, uh, also, we can also offer them in our office. Uh, so for the list, for the full list of the courses that we offer, you can uh, visit our website. Uh, by studios.com and uh, you can look at the schedule for the uh, for the for the course list. Uh, we can also provide uh, customized trainings based on your requirements and your needs. We can uh, combine multiple trainings into one session if needed. Uh, we can offer good value. Um, in addition to that, we also offer a um, we have a certification center at our office. So if you're interested in becoming like an instructor, certified instructor, uh, we receive a certification in a particular software. Uh, we can also provide that for you. Okay, so um, how do we actually, um, how do we typically approach the simulation um, and uh, automation solutions for particular problems? So we'll have a subject matter expert um, that um, have an industry experience in uh, performing the analysis. And so um, based on their knowledge and the experience, uh, we, uh, what we do is we proceed and develop a workflow uh, to perform uh, design and automation and then we, um, develop the script for a particular problem. And then uh, based on the uh, client inputs that we receive, uh, we can uh, develop a tool uh, that uh, can uh, get the uh, uh, desired output for, for you. So this is how we uh, pretty much uh, uh, work with uh, uh, solution automation. Um, I will uh, give a like a brief um, uh, um, Kind of like uh, how we, uh, I, will, I will talk about analysis automation and uh, give you some examples that uh, we have. Uh, I think the first question is um, uh, you might ask, why do we actually do scripting? Like, what's the purpose uh, of scripting in Abacus? Uh, well, um, probably from your experience, Abacus, uh, you might have noticed that uh, you need uh, 
you do some kind of repetitive task um, uh, in Abacus. Uh, for example, when you uh, create a model, uh, you need to uh, construct geometry, apply mesh, um, boundary conditions, loads, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it takes time to do all um, to do all that from scratch. Um, like for example, um, uh, if you develop a model or tool that can construct the model in a fraction of a second, uh, then uh, you can save your valuable time. Um, so um, if you have a lot of models uh, that you need to build from scratch, uh, by automating, uh, by creating a script, you can automate your process. Uh, but uh, you can uh, save time not only in the model building, uh, but also in the uh, job submission, um, post-processing, and uh, also the prescribing the behavior. All of that can be basically achieved uh, in, in uh, using the Python code. Um, you can also extend that functionality by performing tasks uh, that can be um, very time consuming in the uh, advocacy. That's uh, pretty much what I said uh, before. And uh, you can also enhance the interface by using the graphical and non-graphical scripts. So what are they? Uh, so the graphical scripts are basically the, um, they're called the GUI scripts, uh, graph graphical user interface scripts, and uh, non-graphical scripts are uh, called the uh, kernel scripts. So um, basically, uh, uh, customized, um, also the customized version of uh, Abacus can uh, provide an effective tool for a wide range of uh, user expertise. So the Python script um, don't have to be super complex. Um, uh, like uh, what I'm trying to say is that even a non-expert in Abacus can still make a, like a little Python script and, uh, uh, and, and make a little model and simulation and uh, as, as a start of the learning process. So it doesn't have to be very complex. Um, okay, um, let me um, just uh, give a very brief uh, touch of uh, basics of uh, Python scripting. <clears throat> it was um, developed in the, um, um, in 1991 by the, um, in the first version was developed in 1991 by the Guido van Rosen. And, uh, and even the first script actually um, really included a very, um, a good handling and uh, has a lot of functions and uh, uh, core data types. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, it's um, it's a uh, general purpose uh, interpreted interactive uh, and object oriented and high programming uh, language. So uh, it's it's very widely used uh, in, the, in, in the industries, multiple industries. Um, I think the very good, very powerful thing that uh, happened in Abacus with Abacus and Python is that uh, Python is uh, embedded within the Abacus um, product line. Uh, so now uh, Abacus and Python can actually um, directly uh, communicate with, you, with each other. And the interface is so friendly and uh, uh, very easy to learn. Um, you can uh, create uh, Python scripts uh, and run them in Abacus and uh, it basically will do a job for you. Uh, Python is uh, free uh, for download. Um, you can just download for internet. I, just, I put a link here on the, on the slide. Um, I think uh, the, way, the more, import, more important question, uh, why, why do we actually need to use Python and Abacus? Well, that's a fair question. Um, with uh, Python and Abacus, you can uh, use it as a uh, pre-processing. As I mentioned, you can uh, build a model using the Python script. Uh, you can um, also use it for the submitting and monitoring the jobs. Uh, you can use it for parametric studies and also for the post-processing like uh, accessing the ODB file, which you generate after you submit in the job in Abacus. And also you can customize those um, output files um, that you uh, develop after, that you actually produce after submitting the job. Uh, so you customize, you can customize those ODB, ODB outputs. Um, and we, all can, we can also, um, we we'll also provide the trainings um, uh, introduction to Abacus scripting class in our office. So uh, feel free to contact us for that. Um, so besides Abacus, uh, in Simulate Portfolio, we also have several other uh, tools uh, that, that exist, uh, such as the iSight, uh, FE Safe, and Tosca. Uh, here I'll show the iSight. Uh, it's a software that uh, you can use um, with um, existing simulation codes to build and uh, execute simulation workflows um, to basically automate your workflow or design. Uh, so this is like an automation tool also. Um, I'll give you an example. Let's say you want to um, find the optimized dimensions of a certain design. 
so what you what you can do is uh, you can import your Abacus components um, uh, into the um, Abacus component into the iSight, and then uh, it will have those uh, parameters um, that you had in Abacus. Uh, so uh, you can optimize those parameters. Uh, let's say you have a length or pressure of a certain of a certain design, and then you run it uh, through this loop. And then uh, you go through the optimization modules, you set a certain parameter that you want to optimize, and then um, it's gonna go in a loop until it finds the desired value as an output. Um, that uh, training was, was offered the training for that also. also. So um, it's, uh, it's a very good tool uh, to use. Uh, we use it um, very extensively in our project. Uh, here are some of the examples um, of plugins that we are. Uh, that, were, that are available on the 3ds um, uh, website um, 3ds.com uh, you can go to 3ds.com support uh, knowledge base and uh, you can find those uh, examples uh, so what we have here is um, the first uh, you can see on the left top left we have a plugin for development in the honeycomb um, model uh, we, we have a plugin for the uh, bottom net washer model um, plugin for development, uh, developing uh, protodynamic orbit plots, and the plugin for the developing and uh, airflow profile uh, from point cloud data. There are many more examples. Uh, this is just a few that I uh, put here. Um, uh, what you can do is to go on the 3ds website and uh, create an ID and password, and uh, you can uh, search uh, for those plugins and download them, download download them for free. In this section, uh, I'm going to talk about the automation uh, customization, and I'll show you some uh, more interesting examples here. So, um, Abacus um, customization with Python can be accomplished by the writing the kernel script. Uh, so, um, kernel script uh, it doesn't change the graphical user interface in Abacus. Uh, what it's, it's it's simply a code uh, which can be written in a, like a notepad. Um, it's a code. Uh, where you can build a model um, and also do post-processing, of course. Um, so uh, next we have a really simple GUI. Uh, uh, so we where we actually have a graphical user interface um, where we create some uh, dialog boxes uh, in which you can um, actually modify some certain parameters. Um, actual picture on the uh, top, uh, bottom right, that's the simple um, uh, RSG uh, plugin so that we can uh, develop is just a simple example you can see the plate uh, you can modify the parameters the width and the height and then the radius of the circle um, then you can uh, specify the load and then you can run the uh, simulation again uh, using this plugin you can it will save you a lot of time in the uh, pre-processing um, so uh, you, we, we, de we develop more complex uh, plugins but this is just an example um, we also have a standard plugin um, in which uh, which is a little more advanced in the sense that uh, you can create a code in such a way that uh, it will uh, generate its own dialog boxes. Um, it's 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 uh, its own way of accepting their user user input data. I'll show you some of the examples later on. Um, another one is the uh, custom toolbar button. Uh, as it sounds, you can uh, create your own customized toolbar buttons, uh, which you can uh, use in your model. Um, and then uh, we also have a uh, custom applications. Um, so what it what it is it's it's like another application um, that uh, you can develop in Abacus for a specific purpose. Um, uh, we have a we have a we have example uh, uh, further on that I will show. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, it's, it's very cool uh, thing to me that, uh, that I realized. Uh, it's like basically software in the software. And then we also have a subroutine um, which is. Um, which are customization on its own. Um, it's not a script, um, but what it does, it uh, let's say you have a complex boundary conditions in your model, uh, which are not present in Abacus CE uh, as a default. So you cannot actually find them in Abacus CE. Uh, that would, what you can do is uh, you can uh, write your own uh, user subroutines in the input file, and then uh, you can uh, run that uh, in Abacus model. Uh, which uh, which support those subroutines, and then you can uh, submit uh, your analysis uh, using the input file. So you write those subroutines in the input file, and then you submit them. Um, this is uh, in short. Um, so this is um, uh, some of the uh, kernel and GUI uh, script example. 
Uh, on the left hand side, what you can see is the uh, we have a femoral component. Um, it's from the biomedical industry. Uh, it's uh, basically on your knee. Uh, uh, you have a component that it sits, sits on the implant. Uh, so uh, using the command below, uh, you can find um, uh, how much interference there is uh, between the two components. Um, the reason for that, you try to avoid the interference before you start the analysis. So uh, you develop that script. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, um, we have another example which shows um, how to perform the customized uh, type of post processing. Uh, so what you do is you write a code um, uh, and you can, uh, where you can select uh, and make a specific cut section. Uh, you can get specific field output and um, uh, just uh, create a script for that and then run the uh, post process analysis. Uh, so because, because you can also do that in Apple C, uh, no problem, but um, if you write in the script, uh, it will uh, pretty much um, save you a lot of time in, um, in the post process operation. So, uh, it it can you can do uh, it much faster with a code. Uh, here, what I'm uh, showing you, uh, it's um, a real simple kernel script where you can uh, uh, where you simply create the materials. Uh, basically, um, in the first line, what you can see uh, is the um, it's the script is referring to the model, uh, which uh, model one. And uh, what, then what we do is we define the material, uh, uh, such as identity and elastic modules for that, um, uh, for that model. Um, and uh, using a very simple code, uh, you can uh, automate uh, the creation of material. Again, you can also do that in the Abaca CE, but uh, suppose, let's say, uh, you, have, uh, you want to produce 10 different models. Uh, it's very efficient to create a code and uh, copy that code uh, to the new model, pretty much copy and paste. Uh, again, that will save you a lot of time, um, valuable time. Uh, and I think that would say um, it's, uh, it's a very good way to learn Python script uh, besides Abacus documentation. Um, you can also create this replay files in Abacus. Uh, so uh, every time you launch a model in Abacus CE, a replay file is uh, created automatically. It's called um, uh, a .rpu. Uh, so whatever actions you take in Abacus CE, they're actually um, it kind of like saved in the form of the Python commands in that uh, .rpu file. Uh, so what you can do, how you can start learning Python uh, uh, code in Abacus, um, it's the, you can backtrace of what you did, uh, like what command you use, and then um, you can see what uh, code you've developed. Uh, so um, it's, 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 that's the way uh, I started learning uh, Python um, uh, in Abacus CE. So it's very, very useful. Um, and another way uh, is to use the Abacus, uh, what's called the uh, macro manager. In Abacus, you can uh, record the macros, uh, which will be written in the Python script. Uh, so what you do is you run your macro manager, uh, you go to file, if it's in Abacus, go to file and go to the macro manager. And then um, you can create your actions like um, materials, um, loads. And then what you do is, uh, again, you go to that uh, Python script uh, that this uh, macro manager will generate, and uh, you can uh, see uh, what commands that uh, you have used uh, uh, while doing this process. Uh, this is um, a very short uh, type of a cross script um, of creating the viewports and the post processing. So what we're doing here is uh, uh, through script, um, we're going to find a, a cooling plastic train. Uh, so rather than um, going to other field outputs, I can go straight to what I want, and then uh, I can uh, create a picture and snapshot of it. So uh, this little script will save you uh, tons of time um, by just uh, with just the creating of what you need of what the picture, and then you can just put that picture in the, your PowerPoint and then show it to your client. Let's say uh, again, it's it's for the time uh, time saving purpose. Uh, so uh, here I'm going to uh, hand over to my colleague, Chris, and then he will talk about um, some uh, GUI customization, and then I will continue from there uh, talking about the, uh, give you some more examples. Uh, Chris, it's all yours. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Georgie. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. It. Thank you. Oh, okay, everyone. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk about some of the different GUI customization options within Abacus CAE. Uh, we're going to kind of start from something simple all the way down to the more involved type of example. The first 
way you can uh, do a GUI customization within Abacus CAE is through the really simple GUI plugin, or you basically use what is called the um, there's an RSG builder allow you to build kind of the widget layout or the window layout with the widgets in it of your actual dialog, and then you can connect it to a kernel script. The while it's relatively easy to get started with that, um, the issue with that is it's not going to be as involved as some of the other options. Um, it's a what you would call a WYSIWYG type design. It's static. It does not um, change as you go through and uh, make selections within uh, the GUI or enter in things into the widgets within the GUI. The next type of uh, GUI plugin would be a standard plugin. In this situation, now you're getting more involved. Um, we'll, there's an actual slide coming up that talks more, we'll go into more detail about this, but basically in this type of standard plugin design, it's typically designed where you're gonna make it dynamic. So when you go to make user selections, say, uh, you know, you might have a combo box where you make a selection and then you have another combo box or another widget that gets updated based on the selection of that first item in, in the first combo box. You can create some very elaborate dialogues uh, with this uh, type of standard plugin design. Next, we can create a custom toolbar, which contains buttons that, in this case, this is something you would see in CAE right now, um, where these are dockable, undockable um, regions within um, the actual GUI window, the main window of Abacus CAE. And these toolbar buttons can be connected to, let's say, a kernel script so that when you press the button itself, it goes off and executes some type of uh, code behind the scenes and does some type of pre or, pre or post processing. And then finally, we get into what's called a custom application. This is the most sophisticated um, customization option within Abacus CAE, but this allows us to really modify the look and feel of Abacus CAE. What's nice about this is you can create a customized workflow that will allow you to hide certain features maybe within Abacus CAE for users that are less familiar and don't need to have all those options available to them. So if you create this customized workflow, it, it creates this environment when the, this customized application is open so that the user can just go in and kind of work through a, a particular workflow in a, in a seamless fashion. Okay, now if we look at the same, um, let's say GUI customization options and we look at automation with an advocacy CAE again, um, this is a uh, graph that tries to kind of lay out visually where do these different options rank relative to increasing complexity? And then with increasing complexity, how does that affect productivity or efficiency um, associated with your automation workflow? In the lower left corner of this graph, we have the, the very general, uh, generalized uh, crude approach where you're going to create everything manually. You're going to go into CAE, you're going to create your model, you're going to set everything up. And then if you're going to post process anything after it solves, you're gonna do all of that manually. We can move forward into a kernel script. In, in this case, we will increase level complexity. You know, you have to understand not just Python, but then Abacus Python. Um, and then, but the benefit of that, you are going to increase the efficiency of your workflow. Next, we go up into a uh, RSG plugin. You know, now you're wrapping a um, GUI window around that so that you don't have to modify the script all the time if you wanna change parameter values. And then finally, we move up to the next two items where it would be a standard plugin, and then finally that custom application. And again, as you work up, you will increase complexity uh, and, and require more knowledge to develop some of these items, but with that becomes uh, an increase in efficiency, efficiency and productivity associated with your automation workflow. Okay, this slide looks at how does the GUI and kernel processes interact? So this is a very simple, simple, uh, simplified schematic of what this might look like, like behind the scenes, but we're gonna kind of walk our way through this. So what happens is you, you go into Advocacy AE and you open your plugin from the plugins menu. As soon as you open that plugin, a, or when you go to click on to open the plugin, 
a form is activated. Within that form, there's something called AFX keywords or keyword values that can be stored and they're connected to the different components associated with your GUI, what we'll call widgets. So when the form is activated, it launches a dialog box, which we'll call the GUI window. Within that GUI window, you have these widgets or areas within it where you can collect user input. That user input, again, is connected to some of these, um, those fields within that user input or within those widgets are connected to these AFX keywords so that when you hit the OK or Apply button within that GUI window, those values get passed to that form again. And those values are populated there and stored. The GUI commands are issued, and then the mode processing takes place. And in this case, you can perform some additional checks. Uh, maybe you check to see if keyword values make sense or so forth. Finally, a command string is passed to the kernel method of interest, and that command string will contain the values that were stored in those AFX keywords. In the examples, the live demos will present, uh, we're lo actually looking at doing um, a pressure vessel, a simple pressure vessel model. And so we'll just be building the actual model itself. Okay, so for the last two slides, we're gonna talk about an RSG plugin, and then again, some more information related to the actual standard plugins. So if we look at the figure here, we have a simple, one simple dialogue and it was created using the RSG Builder or RSG plugin. What we're looking at is we have a diagram on the right, which you can look at the different parameters associated with the model you're gonna to try to construct, and then you can fill in the parameter values on the left in these what are called text fields. So when you hit OK, what it's gonna do is gonna take those values, it's gonna pass those to the kernel script, and it's gonna build the model, just like you see there with the right parameters associated with the radius, height, and width of your model. So while that might give you some flexibility in what you wanna do, you may wanna do something more elaborate, let's say without building yet another GUI, separate GUI, what if you wanted to now have a GUI that constructs not only a circular plate or a, a plate with a circular hole, but with also an elliptical hole. So what would that look like? Well, we might have two radio buttons, and when you click on a radio button associated with the circular hole, it would give you what you see here. And then if you click on the other radio button for the elliptical hole design, then it would update the parameter listing for you know, A and B associated with the ellipse, as well as the diagram to show the elliptical hole embedded in your plate versus that circular hole. So you would get direct interaction, a dynamic uh, interaction with the um, actual dialogue when you're making user selections. And that's, again, the, the main difference between a standard plugin and what we'll call a static or RSG plugin. Okay, on my last slide here, uh, what we're looking at is what are the different options or what are the different components associated with standard plugins? What makes them so versatile? So not only can you create custom dialogues, but these dialogues can be very elaborate. Um, you can put a large variety of widgets that are available and customizable um, through the Abacus GUI toolkit. Um, you can take a dialogue and you can open up additional dialogues for user input, close those dialogues, that information can be passed back to that original dialogue. Those, those GUIs or dialogue windows can update dynamically. As I gave the example before, maybe you have a drop down menu that gets auto populated based on a, some type of selection before, or maybe you open up, a, maybe the drop down menu contains all the ODB files that are available for user selection or user interaction with an advocacy. So if I go into advocacy or in viewer and I open up another ODB file, that menu automatically gets populated with that ODB file for uh, possible selection. Tables can be filled from text files. Regions can be disabled or enabled depending on whether you want the user to be able to access certain features of the GUI at certain times within um, what they're doing. Um, 
warning and information dialogues can be posted. Uh, this is a this is a nice thing um, to kind of give feedback to the user if they're trying to do something that was not meant to happen. Um, so that you know you, what you're trying to do there is obviously prevent some type of error, catching errors or preventing errors from happening when they go to submit the dialogue. File menus can be created just like in advocacy. Um, you can potentially tie them to um, you know opening a a website HTML file, PDF file for user manual. You can set defaults, um, open files, and so forth. You can create elaborate tables and manipulate the tables within um, that GUI framework. And then finally, uh, this will be talked about in the uh, one of the live demos, but there's a something called an AFX PIC procedure. In this procedure um, tied to um, the GUI design, um, you can actually interact with Abacus CAE and allow the user to pick something from the viewport. So instead of just having them enter in values, or let's say you want to specific, pick specific nodes to process, the user, if the model, or yes, if the model is available within CAE for display already, the user can go in and actually pick those values or pick those nodes, pick those vertices, whatever that geometric entity is, and that information gets passed back to the GUI and collected and then can be um, used to process whatever you need to instead of having to actually uh, manually enter in a vertex or a specific nodal value. Okay, I'm going to pass um, the presentation back over to my colleague Georgie so he can go through, quickly go through a series of um, additional standard plugins and then we'll go into the live demos. Okay, um, thanks, Chris. Uh, so uh, regarding the the plugins, um, I want to show you the some examples of it. Um, here, I'm showing you the pretty much the standard uh, uh, standard plugin example. Uh, it's called the thickness mapping tool, uh, which is also available on the 3ds.com website. Uh, it's very uh, useful for in, uh, for engineers that perform the level three uh, fitness service assessments for of the structures such as um, pressure belts, pressure vessels, tanks, or drums. Um, for example, if you have a, um, uh, for example, if you have a, a corroded tanks, uh, what you can do is you can uh, map the thickness of that corroded region onto the cylindrical of the curved surface. Um, you have a um, data in your Excel sheet, and then you select the uh, appropriate values and then uh, vertices uh, to map your uh, thickness um, on that region. And this thickness is, uh, again, very critical for the fitness for service assessment uh, because you need to understand whether that uh, region is going to be uh, filling or not. So, yeah, we have that uh, plugin that is available, very, uh, very useful uh, plugin. Um, uh, the next one is the uh, stress uh, strain calculator plugin. Uh, it's uh, also very useful for the uh, level uh, three fitness for service assessment. Um, on the left hand side, you can see that uh, very like complex uh, type of material behavior. And uh, what uh, this uh, plugin uh, has, it's, uh, it has embedded all these calculations. Um, and uh, uh, all you need to do is to specify like a simple parameters, uh, elastic modules, Poisson ratio, uh, durating factor. And uh, what will do this plugin will generate a stress and strain curve and uh, it will generate the uh, material uh, model for you. Um, again, it's uh, very fast and uh, yeah, pretty simple to use. Um, um, another uh, good example uh, where you want to define the uh, connections between the various surfaces like springs or dashboards or let's say PC constraints. Uh, so uh, you can specify those surfaces uh, that will uh, uh, pretty much automatically will uh, create uh, uh, the, the, the springs and um, the dashboards for you. Uh, and uh, uh, this plugin is also available in the uh, knowledge base. Another very uh, good example is the, um, is the uh, it's a creation of a, of a straight face. And uh, what you want to do is you can, uh, let's say you want to wrap around, um, around your model, uh, kind of like a cylindrical shape uh, structure. Uh, you can use our plugin. Um, you don't have to do this geometry manually in your advocacy. Again, uh, specifying and varying some of the parameters, um, you can use that plugin to automatically generate 
uh, this uh, complex uh, type of shape um, in your you know, for your analysis. Uh, now, uh, what I want to show you uh, some of the uh, recent uh, um, uh, some of the recent um, uh, pl GU plugins that we work with. What we work with, um, as I mentioned, that uh, we have a plugin software within the software. Again, um, it's a very cool uh, software that um, we use a lot. Uh, 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 so what um, you can uh, create a very customized uh, Abacus, Abacus applications, uh, which is uh, particularly uh, focused in certain areas. Uh, in this example, you can see the uh, AKS uh, simulator, AKS uh, um, Abacus knee simulator. Uh, what it does, it simulates implants uh, inside a human body, uh, specifically the knee implants. Uh, so what you can uh, uh, what you can is you can uh, bring your geometry um, like ex um, imported from the from the external source. Uh, let's let's say that the client uh, will provide us geometry. Typically, uh, what we do is so we'll correctly position them, orient uh, orient them, and uh, create the, the connectors, loads, and bearing conditions, and then perform the the modeling simulations uh, on those geometries. Um, you can uh, then compare your simulations with the physical testing. Um, uh, again, from the past experience, um, we noticed that the results are very, very closely uh, correlated with the uh, and matches match with the experimental values. So uh, this is very useful um, uh, plugin that uh, we use extensively. Um, again, the primarily reasons uh, why we want to use this um, AKS simulator is to uh, mainly save costs. Um, Again, number of redesigns, and also um, we want to um, uh, save the time to market, and um, also we want to uh, make sure that our patient safe, uh, uh, safety uh, because they will perform very accurate um, analysis. Another good example of a GUI plugin uh, is the because uh, welding interface. Um, uh, if you would like to um, again access for it, uh, contact us. Uh, for this application, uh, you can create uh, multiple uh, welds in one model. Uh, for example, on a pipeline on a, or pressure vessel, uh, which you can uh, do then select the beads or chunks uh, for each the weld, and then um, uh, you can uh, select the custom weld pass sequence and then simulate the, the whole welding process. Uh, so uh, using this uh, plugin, you can build the entire thermal model uh, with a um, kind of like an automatic generation of um, of a, and then um, then you can perform the thermal stress analysis of of that model. Again, it's uh, automated, uh, saves, saves tons of time for you. Um, another good example uh, for the GUI plugin is, the, is to model the fracture. Uh, using this uh, plugin, uh, you can do the fracture assessment for a pipeline uh, with a circumferential uh, crack at the grid weld. Uh, so um, again, it will help you to access the um, or determine whether the crack will uh, develop under the Certain uh, loading and uh, and the certain boundary conditions. Um, you can uh, specify these very types of um, uh, options that you can specify. Uh, um, it's some of them uh, listed here, but um, it's again instead of creating this whole uh, weld uh, manually, you just uh, plug in numbers and it will automatically generate the, the weld, and you can perform the uh, the fracture mechanics assessment. And then uh, what we do, uh, you can do the post-processing of fresh assessments. Um, uh, so um, this is uh, pretty much uh, how you validate your um, uh, your uh, assessment. Uh, it's uh, it was, uh, this tool was uh, validated with um, a commercial software, uh, Fee Crack, using the elastic plastic material properties, and uh, you um, you generate the output and. Uh, it, again, it's closely closely matched with a with a commercial software. And the GUI example uh, is a wound, a wound composite uh, modeler for pressure vessels. Um, so this GUI is very useful in the way that you can uh, easily specify the uh, composite material layer by layer. Uh, you can generate uh, various uh, layer types, um, uh, yeah, inclusions, the, uh, the the helicals uh, within uh, without friction, um, and the hoop type layers. Uh, so um, uh, basically, uh, this plugin will allow you to post process post, post process the stresses and strains of uh, of your model. Uh, for the engineers who work in the subsea uh, subsea world uh, or subsea oil and gas industry, uh, uh, they probably uh, 
familiar with the jumpers. Uh, jumper is basically the M-shaped or U-shaped type of uh, design that is used in connecting the structures, so like a flat uh, with manifold or flat to flat. So what we can do is also um, simulate the design of it. Uh, we have a M plugin, and um, what it does, it uh, I believe in the next slide I have yeah the tool. So I'm just going to go to jump in. Um, so what you can do this uh, using this uh, um, it's called jump on an automation tool. Uh, is you uh, pretty much define the coordinates of your um, you know, jumper, and then uh, you enter the material properties, uh, density of a product um, uh, that's going through the jumper, and then uh, what you can do is uh, you can perform the uh, stress analysis of of, of, of this uh, jumper and see uh, how it's um, uh, thermally expanding and uh, where where the stresses are and how much stress you have on the on the points. Um, so yeah, it's 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 again, it's very um, very easy uh, tool to use and uh, very useful and uh, um, saves a lot of time. Uh, now uh, I'm going to um, uh, hand it to Michelle and she will um, uh, present the videos. Uh, thank you uh, guys uh, for listening and um, uh, yeah, uh, Michelle, please. Okay, I'm going to do a series of two demos here. The first one being a kernel script demo, and the second one for an Abacus CA plugin or GUI. For both demos, the Python API or application programming interface to Abacus is used to interface with CAE. Uh, for the kernel demo, the Abacus scripting interface or ASI is used to create the Python script that will be used to build the entire front element model. In this case, it's going to be a simple, simple pressure vessel, and uh, everything is automated from the creation of the geometry, loading, uh, boundary conditions, mesh, and also two additional capabilities for automation are included. Uh, first one being a local job submittal, and the second one, simple post processing uh, for display of a contour plot. So let's get into this. What we'll do is we're just going to run a script. We have a couple different options for running a script, either file menu down here um, at the kernel command line interface, or in this case, I just opened CAE. I'm just going to run it from here. This is the main script we're going to run. These two additional Python files or modules that will import and access functions in. So if we run the script, we get a little bit of output here showing us where it's at in the script. I have some print statements scattered throughout just to give you an idea of, of what's going on and where you're at. So we can see we have a pressure vessel created here just with flat end caps. Um, we have some seating down through the length. We have some bias seating. We have some edge seating set up around here. We have the pressure internal and ex external pressures applied. And then we also have um, a fixed boundary condition on the uh, top and bottom edge. If we look at the tree structure here, for this particular model, um, there's a part. We have these nine features that are created for us. We have a number of sets, surfaces, section assignment, material, and then finally the internal and external pressure as well as the boundary conditions. All right, so now let's get into what the script actually looks like. So this is a, this is a kernel script here um, that we just ran. Um, Here's the parameters for defining uh, what's needed for defining the geometry. Here's the uh, pressure values. And these are the two additional parameters, which are set to false right now. Uh, we can go back later and set them to true if we wanted to run them. Um, but we'll actually take care of that in the GUI. So here's coordinates are created for the external um, boundaries of the part. This is where the actual part is created. Down here, we create surfaces for the pressure loading. Uh, we create sets that are going to be used later for the boundary conditions. 
and then materials, partitioning. Here's the edge seating. Um, we have some double bias seating and we have some edge seating by size. We set the element type, we mesh the whole part, create an assembly, create the steps. In this case, it's just a single uh, static loading step. We apply our pressure loads, the boundary conditions, and then these are the two additional um, options that could be called. Um, right now, the they're they're going to be they're not going to be run because that statements are going to be evaluated to be false. But we could run the job locally and do a simple post processing. So if we come back up here, uh, a couple of things to note are a lot of what you'll see through here is you'll see this find at method and that particular method is used to help locate geometric entities whenever you're trying to uh, automate the construction of a model within CAE. So let's go out to the top and if we move back over, we can look at our model again. I'm just going to come up to where those parameters were defined. These ones are overriding the ones up above, so I'm just going to comment those out and we're going to rerun it. So let me just save this and let's rerun it and we should get a different model. So let's go back to the mesh. There's the mesh. Obviously, it's a lot shorter than it was before, uh, not quite as refined in certain areas, um, but everything else is there. If we go to the load module, we can see that we have this similar loading as what was in the other model. So that's the basics of a uh, kernel script. Um, we used it here to automate the full construction of the fun element model. Next, we're going to get into a demo on an Abacus CAE plugin. And what we're going to do is we're going to wrap a GUI around this kernel script so that we can uh, gather input from the user um, through the GUI instead of having to manually manipulate the uh, kernel script. So let's get started on the next uh, video. Thanks. Okay, now we'll get into the second demo. Uh, for the second demo, uh, the Abacus GUI toolkit was used to help uh, generate the Abacus CA plugin that we're going to see. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a standard uh, CA plugin. It allows uh, dynamic feedback, essentially. Um, this plugin is a GUI that wraps around a kernel script we just discussed. And instead of having the hard coded parameters uh, that we had to manually uh, change in the kernel script, uh, now we can collect user input from the GUI. Um, in many cases, there's text fields or um, tables that can be uh, entered, have data entered into. Uh, there could be lists that are picked from or drop down menus or radio buttons and so forth. Um, but alternatively, there's another ability that's available uh, through the plugins. Um, you can introduce some user interaction with CAE where the user has to actually pick something within the viewport. And we're gonna have an example of that with this GUI. So let's get started. Um, I basically just started having a CAE again. And in this case, to access the plugin, uh, we just come up here, plugins, it's called PV Builder, and here's the plugin. So let's talk a little bit about what we have here. So we have our in this particular plugin, it's a, it's a single dialog box. Um, there's two tabs. There's a couple buttons up here. Um, these buttons actually don't really have functionality right now with the, the GUI itself, but I just wanted to emphasize uh, different options you can uh, do when uh, designing a GUI. Uh, you could have uh, file and other menus up top, just like in CAE. Um, we have these buttons down here. One will allow the the main part of the script to be built or the model to be built. This can cancel out just like up here. This tab here is just kind of a uh, tab to collect information for the particular project or, or uh, case that you're running. 
and then it could be output to a text file or something else uh, to help keep track of the analysis that you're running. If we move over to the model input tab, this is where we get into um, collecting the main user input for creating the model. So what do we have here? We have the inner radius, we have a wall thickness and height. These are parameters that we saw uh, tied to the kernel script we looked at a little while ago. We had our internal and external pressure. We had some mesh controls. In this case, it looks like we have these radio buttons. Uh, we have our job controls. We can submit a job. Oh, and if we click on this, if you don't submit the job, you have nothing to display. So if this is grayed out or disabled, if we do submit the job, we have the option to also post-process the results. So right now we're going to keep that off. And then we have our boundary conditions. We have uh, the fixed ends, and we'll start with that. Um, that's what we used um, in the kernel script itself. If we want to help the user to um, know what's going on with the GUI and how to specify some of these values and what they may be, uh, what it might be associated with, in this case, it's put, it's pretty uh, self-explanatory for the most part. But if we click on, um, you can introduce some help buttons or info buttons, just like CAE has. And in this case, we have something that uh, this little dialogue that pulls up that has a, a graphic of what the um, cross section of the model is so that we know what the uh, parameters are to define the model. We have the thickness, we have the inner, inner radius, and we have the height of the cylinder. You can add some notes down below here. In this case, I made a note here, a constant wall thickness is assumed. So we can dismiss that. We can pull back up if you need to look at it. You can move it around, whatever you need to do. But let's get rid of it. We don't need it right now. So we'll keep the pressure as is. Um, I think we'll, we'll change the external pressure to um, essentially zero. Unfortunately, we can't change it to zero here because um, Abacus is wanting you to specify some type of magnitude. Um, you know, an option could be um, if you didn't want to use external pressure, you could have some radio buttons here to um, essentially have options within the kernel script, some if statements that would um, assign different uh, pressure loading depending on what those radio buttons were, maybe an internal and external and both. Um, but in this case, we can almost get to um, you know a zero pressure on the outside by specifying one. Uh, we're going to keep mesh controls at course, fixed ends like we said. If we click on create the model, here's our model, kind of similar to what it was before. Um, we can come in here and we can change to fine mesh. And it takes a little longer to build, but if we turn on the mesh, okay, so it's definitely uh, more refined mesh. If we come look under load okay we got our uh, loading that we expect and so the these two specific radio buttons all they're going to do then since there's no parameters that you're defining and they're just going to have hard-coded values but gives you a very quick and easy way to define a course and find mesh but if we click on custom mesh you see the GUI changes and and what we're doing here is it, you know if, if we're looking at these and you're not defining anything, we don't want all the burden tied up on the real estate of your um, overall size of the screen. So you can hide some information with these GUIs. So when I click on custom mesh, I need the user to, to enter additional information. So uh, the real estate expands so that you can add these additional parameters to specify. In this case, I'm gonna put some different values in here. I'm not going to make things too too big because I want to actually submit this job. So um, let's do something like that. So it's it's not going to be a big model at all. And let's just take a look and see what it looks like first before we actually submit the model. Obviously, not the best mesh if you were trying to analyze this, but good enough for us for testing something out. So we can submit the job again. Um, we'll actually going to display the stress results as well. So if we click run, we're going to see the job models being created. Uh, 
we all we got down all the way to creating and submitting the job locally already. Um, what's going to happen here is it's going to actually wait for execution. And as soon as the analysis is wrapped up, it's going to move into doing the simple post processing. So we went through the input file processor and within a minute here, it should uh, get through the solution. Okay, so it completed successfully and we should expect to see some results. So let's go to visualization and sure enough, there's our results. Our ODB file was already pulled up for us and here's our results and we had it set up so that we would just look at the end of the first step in S33. Okay, I'm not going to post process um, any more jobs right now. But what I wanted to look at is the other feature associated with this GUI. So we talked about before the option to pick, um, pick some entity from the screen. So for this particular GUI example, I included a custom boundary condition case. And what this means is instead of, if we go back to what our loading scenario is and our boundary conditions, we have these edges picked, outer, um, top and bottom diameter of the edges. So what if we wanted to pick something different? So we're gonna do that here. So it's set up to pick vertices. You can do nodes, elements, edges, whatever you want to do. There's all different options, but I just have it set up right now to pick um, vertices. So let's go to here and pick a couple vertices. And let's see what happens. So you notice the Dialog disappeared, then it came back. Um, and it actually, if we go back to the part, go back to load, we can see that loading or the displacement boundary conditions have been changed. Instead of being all the way around the perimeter, top and bottom, now it's just on these two. If we didn't like if we didn't like what we see there, we could say, well, maybe it's actually laying down and welded here. So we're going to actually pick those and we come over to the loading again and we can see that those uh, specific nodes now have that uh, fixed boundary constraint. So it was very easy to change those specific uh, boundary conditions by again having this interaction by being able to pick in the viewport. So that's really all I have right now with the GUI demo itself. I, I just want to summarize that, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of benefits to and flexibility associated with um, creating a custom CA plugin like this. Um, you know, the more complexity you add, um, the more capabilities that are available to the user. And also, um, potentially, the, the less likely the user needs to be as familiar with CAE. Um, you know, when you're not manipulating the input deck and looking at or, um, kernel scripts and all these other things that people have to do if they want to create some automation, if you're looking at just automating it through a GUI like this, you know, you just need maybe a little bit more basic understanding of what's going on. Uh, you know, I think it, wrapping everything up around with the GUI, it, it cleans things up. It gives you uh, a nice portable um, portable GUI, portable code, um, and you limit the, um, the, the ability for people to change things. You know, this is contained in a directory in your Abacus, CA, Abacus underscore plugin directory. And, you know, the, there's no, there's no need to go in and modify the, the Python scripts that are in there like you would if it was just a straight kernel script. So with that, um, we'll open up to any questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Chris. We do have a few questions. Um, do you help with developing a methodology and workflow that can then be automated? Who would like to take that question? Uh, I can take that. 
Uh, so yes, uh, we do develop the methodologies. Uh, as Bernie mentioned uh, in the slides, that uh, we we create the automated scripts. Uh, uh, and uh, if you if you have a particular question or particular projects a project you're working with, uh, you can send us the information, and uh, we'll take a look at the script and uh, develop. Yeah, you can do that. Okay, great. Thank you. And our next question is. How steep is the learning curve for Python and GUI programming? Does Vias help with that training? Uh, okay. Yes. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, go ahead, Georgie. You can start. I'll, I'll pick up after you. Uh, yes, uh, we do. Uh, we do help with the uh, uh, with the training. Uh, we offer the introduction to Abacus, uh, introduction to scripting uh, in Abacus uh, course. And uh, again, uh, the way you can also learn by itself. Uh, one of the one of the ways is the well of course you can use the online resources material uh, you can um, use the, the the books the Python books uh, tutorials um, on, on YouTube also is help very help but uh, also the way um, I learned is to again uh, run a simple uh, model uh, in Abaca CE uh, from scratch and then uh, as I mentioned uh, once you uh, start um, any, anything in the Abacus, it will um, it will help. It will generate the RPU, build RPU file, and then it will create a, a simple uh, script there. And uh, as you build your model in the Abacus CE, it will generally, it will eventually will be building up the model in the script, and that's the way you can learn uh, how um, uh, the, the the script Python scripting. And also GUI, also uh, uh, you can uh, again uh, we can also offer the trainings in a uh, GUI uh, area and. Uh, yeah, we can provide that. Well, we'll forget to provide that for you. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, thanks, Jordan. Um, yeah, to expand on that, uh, my experience with kernel versus GUI uh, coding for Abacus especially is there's definitely a steeper learning curve for doing the GUI uh, scripting. As Jordi indicated, you know, you do have the replay file to access for kernel scripting. Um, so if you do execute commands within the CAE window, you can look at that replay file and see what commands are executed, copy and paste those into a simple text editor, and you can essentially execute that script and, and replicate some of those commands. With the GUI uh, development, it's a, it's a little more complicated than that. Obviously with both of them, you need to understand Python itself, but then you need to understand the connection to Abacus, the APIs associated with that, and then for the GUI, the, the uh, GUI toolkit itself. For the uh, GUI development, you do have something called a GUI state file, which you can uh, print statements back to, uh, similar to printing something uh, from your kernel script, but you are not getting that same type of, you know, uh, you know, you can use the RST builder to help create some of the um, basic dialog functionality or widgets and look at what that code looks like to create those. But as far as interaction between dialogues or widgets and what happens and the whole processing and everything, there's no easy way to um, get that feedback from just a simple file, like a replay file. You just have to, to learn it. And that's where I think the steeper learning curve comes in. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here. It is, do you have experience developing GUIs using non-abacus environment like Java or C Sharp? Uh, I can take that, Georgie. Uh, yes, I, I think, um, you know, we, we could do any type of development outside of Abacus CAE itself. Abacus CAE, um, the GUI toolkit is the Fox toolkit. That's the base uh, toolkit that it's, it's built on. Um, but we can actually go outside of Abacus or connect to it with other, um, you know, uh, types of uh, programming languages or uh, toolkits that are not necessarily tied to Abacus CA itself. Okay, thanks. And then we have this one. Do I need to have object-oriented structure to use Python scripting? So, for the kernel scripting in general, not necessarily. Um, with that, you can more or less go through a more generalized workflow of your script. Uh, when you get into the, um, you know, you're not creating, you don't necessarily have to create classes and so forth. 
Um, that's what I think of more in terms of, uh, and even we'll say functions. Um, but when you get into developing, uh, you know, doing the GUI programming, um, developing the plugin or custom applications, then you definitely have to understand more of the object oriented nature of it because you're going to create classes and, and uh, you're going to create more functions or methods associated with those classes. Great. Thank you. Uh, those are all the questions that we had. I know we went a little bit over time today, so I wanted to thank uh, the people in the audience that hung out with us. And thank you so much to our presenters. And look for this replay in your in-mail. Thanks again. Have a great day.